Hey everybody, uh, welcome. Really, really good to have you. Great to be with you. Welcome all campuses and venues. Those of you tuning in, welcome. Uh, I love it that we are a church that's scattered all over, so I'm really glad everybody is here. Uh, this is January, which means uh, it's a time for casting vision here at CCC. Every year in January, we kind of look through the whole year and try to tell you what we're going to use as kind of a thread to hold this year together. Our purpose statement stays the same. Our purpose for existence here at CCC is to help you come to know Jesus, grow in your relationship with him, and then serve him daily. That's our purpose. But our vision moves kind of like um, a rhythm of breathing in and out, deep and wide. Uh, some years we'll say, you know what, we want to impact the world as much as we can and impact people and grow wider in our impact. And then some years we'll say, you know what, we want to go deep. Last year was a wide year. We wanted to go through last year asking the question, why not me? To God, why not use me right here, right now to do something with you and for you? This year is a deep year, and we're calling it simply Know the Story. Know the Story. Oh, and we have uh, these for you. Uh, this, uh, pick one up, whatever campus you're at. Uh, here at the Hudson campus or right out in the atrium. It's just a, a notebook with Know the Story, and it's blank pages, 52 blank pages. Uh, so you can take notes uh, as we go through the story this year. If you are uh, tuning in online and you want one of these, you can email us. We'll send you one. I might get in trouble for that, but we're going to get you one. All right. <clears throat> uh, well, when we say know the story, I don't just mean read the Bible more. I mean to know the flow of the story because the Bible isn't a collection of a bunch of random stories put together. The Bible is one epic story about how God created the world and how the world was wrecked through sin and how God didn't give up but pursued us and sent us a, a savior, a hero, to redeem us. And he did it at the sacrifice of his own life. It's, it's the story of the universe. It's the story you have always loved in every great movie and every great book because it's written into the very fabric of our world. It was written by God. And what we're going to do in these first six weeks is we're going to kind of do a 30,000-foot flyby and look at the six major sections of the story. We'll, we started last week with creation. This week, we look at what's gone wrong with our world, the world wrecked. Next week, the, the, we'll look at the nation of Israel, which takes up most of the Old Testament, and then Jesus, our Savior, and then the birth of the church, and then finally, the restoration of all things. That'll be the first six weeks. And then we'll head into the Old Testament and Abraham, and then we'll go through the Old Testament then to, the, to Jesus and the New Testament. It's just going to be a great, great year. All right? So last year, or last week was creation. This week is what's wrong with the world. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 3. It's not hard to tell that something is deeply wrong in our world, and the world is broken. Uh, go to any airport. Try to get on a flight. You'll have to take off your shoes. You'll go through some kind of detector to see if you have malintent for that flight. Go to any school, even an elementary school. They'll have lockdown procedures in case a person comes in to shoot the children. We have refugee camps with tens of thousands of people who have fled the only home they've ever known because their country has become so horrible that they packed up everything they could carry and left. Something is broken. This is the story of what happened. Genesis chapter 3, first 13 verses. This is what it says. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, 
and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Okay, this is God's word. All right, the world broke right there. We're going to look at three things and then kind of a fourth thing. We're going to look at how it broke, why it broke, what it broke, and then finally, what God began to do. Okay, so how it broke, why it broke, what it broke, and then what God does. All right? First, how it broke. Now, it starts out with uh, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. All right. We're introduced to the serpent. Later on in the story, we find out that that's Satan. But here, we know surprisingly little about the serpent. We don't know where he came from, what went on with him, why he's doing what he's doing. Uh, And the reason is because the story is not about the serpent. The story is not about Satan. The story is about what's happened to us and what's happened to our world, right? But you need to know that Satan had his work cut out for him, right? He needed to bring his A game Because you have Adam and Eve sitting in the middle of pristine beauty. They had everything they could ever want. They were in paradise. And Satan comes to them, and he's got this plan to introduce a virus into this beautiful world that will actually destroy everything. And he has to be, this is the interesting thing. He has to have Adam and Eve be the carriers of this virus. No other animal will do. It's got to be Adam and Eve. It's got to be the human that will carry the virus of sin and destroy the world. What's, and, and you look at our world now. And all the stuff that I named that the world is broken, you know, with refugee camps. And all, all that's going wrong in our world can all be traced back to human beings. No, nobody says, you know, what the, the big problem with our world is buffaloes, man. They're going crazy, right? Nothing, no, all the other animals are doing okay. It's the human being that has just gone awry, all right? So Satan starts, and he wants to introduce this virus, and this is what he says. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Okay, let me stop there. Uh, this is, I'm, I don't like to overuse the same phrase in the same message, but you're going to hear me say it over and over again. Uh, that this is interesting or this is fascinating because this whole week uh, I've been hitting epiphanies and understanding this better and better. But Satan is going to introduce this virus. To introduce the virus, he creates an atmosphere. And the atmosphere is created with this question. This question, when he says, uh, did God actually say to you, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? If you were an actor... And that was your line to deliver. How would you deliver it? Uh, Because it's written on a page right here, so you have to give it its inflection. So a producer or a writer or whoever does it, I don't know how movies work, comes to you and says, listen, this is your line. How are you going to say it? Will you say it with a smile? Will you say it with a chuckle? Will you say, if you were the serpent, will you say, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any of the trees of the garden. Did he really? Right? What Satan does, he's creating an atmosphere, he's creating an, at- an attitude, and the attitude is contempt. He's uh, ridiculing God. He's mocking God. He's trying to make God look ridiculous to Eve. 
And the thing I find fascinating is here in the 21st century in America, it just makes so much sense to me. I was reading this book uh, this week. Uh, Abdu Murray wrote this book. It's called Grand Central Questions. Abdu Murray is a former Muslim who's become a Christian. He's a, an attorney by trade. Uh, this is an apologetic book. He has joined the Ravi Zacharias staff. But in the portion that I was reading, he was talking about uh, Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins wrote a book called The God Delusion, best-selling book here in America. And The God Delusion, he's, he's one of the new kind of virulent atheists who is just nasty toward anybody who believes in God. And Abdu Murray is talking about a time when, when in 2012, he had, there were 10,000 atheists and agnostics that had gathered at the mall in Washington, D.C., the same place where Martin Luther King Jr. delivered the I Have a Dream speech. But in this particular speech, what Richard Dawkins is encouraging these 10,000 atheists and agnostics to do is to mock people who believe in God. And this is what he says. It says, at the March 24, 2012 Reason Rally, a gathering of up to 10,000 atheists and agnostics on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., Dawkins exhorted his non-religious devotees to mock theists and their beliefs publicly. This is a quote from that speech. Dawkins says, mock them, ridicule them in public. Don't fall for the convention that we're too polite to talk about religion. Religion is not off the table. Religion is not off limits. Religion makes specific claims about the universe which needs to be substantiated and need to be challenged, and if necessary, need to be ridiculed with contempt. Okay? That's what I want to <clears throat> tell you. When someone mocks you for believing something that God has said, when they come to you and they say, to you, you actually believe that God created the world in six days. You actually believe that you're supposed to save yourself until marriage. You actually believe that sexuality is supposed to be reserved for a man and a woman in a marriage for in a monogamy. And that's all you believe that sexuality is supposed to be reserved for. You actually believe that. When someone mocks you, you don't have to get defensive, but an alarm should go off. You need to recognize, you need to say, wait, wait, I recognize that voice. I recognize that voice. Because what Satan did, if he, he is about to introduce a virus into the world. And this virus is going to lead to all war, all racism, all hatred, every bit of pain you have ever experienced is going to be unleashed with this virus. And the first thing he does is create an atmosphere of contempt where he tries to say, God's being ridiculous. You don't have to listen to God. And then he goes on and he says this. Uh, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay. This is where the virus actually comes into Eve and then into Adam. And what Satan does is he first starts this kind of atmosphere, the attitude of contempt. But then in order to introduce this virus into the human element, the human experience, this virus of sin, what he does is he, he doesn't have them doubt the existence of God. He knows he doesn't have to get them to even doubt the word of God or to, to doubt that God cares about what they're doing. Like he didn't come to them and say, you know what, God doesn't, God's got a lot of, he's got bigger fish to fry. He doesn't really worry about what you're doing. Go ahead and do it. What he gets them to do is doubt the goodness of God. That's all he had to do. He had to get Eve to doubt the good. What he got Eve to do was to say this, listen, if, if I obey God, I'll miss out. God doesn't know or doesn't want what's very best for me. And if I obey him, I'll miss out. There, there's a thing called uh, FOMO now, fear of missing out. And it started with, uh, with smartphones, evidently, because when a smartphone goes off, you grab it right away, and they call it because that, that thing that pulls you to your smartphone is your fear of missing out on something. 
And that's all Satan does, is to say, listen, God isn't good. He doesn't know what's best. And this has changed the way I've prayed this week. And maybe this is why I'm so pumped about this message, because it's changed me. This week, I started writing, you know, I, I use a prayer journal, and I write my prayers. And at the end of, of my prayers each day this week, I rehearse the goodness of God. Because I feel like it's almost like taking a, a vitamin against the virus. And the virus is the thing that, that threatens to destroy my life, like it threatens to destroy yours. And anything I can do to fight off that virus is good. But, but I, I divide the good, I'm pretty simple, so I divide the goodness of God, and I just rehearse his head and his heart. Because that's where his goodness is. And, the simpli- and this is what I think. If I believe that God is smarter than me, that's his head. And then I f- if I believe that he really loves me, that's his heart, then I'll do whatever he wants. I'll do whatever he says. But if I begin to doubt his head that he may not know quite as well as I do about anything, or if I begin to doubt his heart, then I'm in deep, deep danger. And listen, we doubt one of the two all the time. I mean, you, you could be doubting that you, you have somebody who hurts you deeply, and you say, yeah, I know the Bible says I'm supposed to forgive, but I, I, I'm, I don't. I can't. What do you, which one are you doubting, his head or his heart? You say, oh, yeah, I know what the Bible says about how I'm supposed to handle my money, and I, you know, deep down, I know I'm supposed to be giving more to something in God's name or whatever, but you know what? I, I'm just not going to do that. I know I'm not supposed to be sleeping with this person that I'm not married to, but, you know, I, I just want you to know. You're doubting one of the two. So that's what I started to write down in my prayers. First, I rehearsed something about his, how smart he is. Like yesterday, it was gravity. I was just going, God, I can't believe you created gravity. I don't even know what it is. I don't know how it works. It's crazy. Thanks. I love Joe. And then I rehearse his heart, and I say, listen, if I ever doubt that you love me, how can I ever look at the cross and doubt that you love me? Because when I was at my very worst, you loved me the very most. Nobody's ever done that for me. All right? So that's, the first, that's, that's how it broke. Now the question is why it broke. It's so what happens. Uh, the, the thing that, the reason why it broke is that when this virus of sin entered into the human bloodline, it changed the flow of creation from love to power. When I say that, what I mean is this. Love, the flow of love, is my life for yours. How can I serve you? What can I do for you? That's the flow of love. Power, on the other hand, is your life for mine. What can you do for me? How can you make my life better? How can you serve me? So what happens, uh, God confronts Adam in verse 11, and he says, uh, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Verse 12, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. (laughs) Don't you wish you were there when he said that? He's looking up, I I figure he's looking up at God, right? And he says, um, God says, what have you done? And Adam goes, uh, yeah, I know we have a problem. You know, <laughs> it's, it's her. He, he's, this is the first time, I think, in human history that a woman turned and tried to kill a man with her eyes. That was the first time. Because she was going, what? Are you kidding? You know, but what he did was he threw her under the bus. What he was saying to God, and I want you to get this. He was saying, God, I know we have a problem. And this is the problem. I think you should send this woman to hell and give me a new wife because she's really the the issue, right? What he does is he said, in order to make himself look good, he needs to make her look bad. You want to know why you compare yourself to people all the time? Do you want to know where that started? It started here. Do you know why it's so hard to get away from? What you do when you compare yourself to someone else is you're always, because that's the way the mechanism of the world works now, because it was changed here, is that in order for you to feel good about yourself, somebody else has to pay the price. Somebody else has to look bad. So we're constantly doing that. We do it all the time. And if you want to watch it in, in technicolor, 
watch politics, right? The next 11 months are going to be brutal because every single politician, in order to look good, needs to make somebody else look bad. But it's almost impossible to get away from. If you try to get away... You know what I hate? I hate people that compare themselves to each other, to other people all the time. I hate those guys. Those guys are the worst. Right? I hate people who hate people. I wish... <laughs> People who are intolerant should be shot, right? I mean, people do it all the time. You can't get away from comparing yourself to someone else in order to make yourself look good. And that's what happened, and it started right there. The other thing that started right there was relationally, our relationships, because they turned into power, turned into cost-benefit relationships. We do cost-benefit all the time. When I sit with people who want to get divorced, that's almost always what they say. They say, you know what? It's not working. Why isn't it working? I'm given way more than I'm getting. It, it's, it's just simple cost-benefit, Pastor. Easy. And what they try to do is get me on their side to see how much they're getting ripped off. And then, so I'll join them and go, oh, yeah, you should get divorced. But God created a covenant, right? The covenant of marriage, and we're going to get into the covenant later next week with Israel, God created a covenant just because this problem started in Genesis 3, where we do cost-benefit, because he knew this about us. So he said, we're going we're gonna to make a promise that when, it wasn't, when it's not working out in your best benefit, when, it, when you're getting the short end of the stick, you'll stay together, because you made a promise. That's the only thing that keeps us together, because of the way we work now. And I want you to see, too, that Eve does the same thing. That's called you know, the original sin. Everybody is infected, Right? What do I get out of it? The other thing that I, f I finish my prayers every week, every day this week, with asking God, oh God, by the way, is there anything I can do for you today? And it was such a difference because most of my prayers, if I look back on my prayer journals, are filled with things that, my suggestions to God and what he could do for me that day. And so are yours. But for me to say to him, you know what? I want to get back to love, not power. And for you, I want to ask, is there anything I can do for you today? Because I'm yours, All right? So that's why it broke. Now, what it broke? It broke basically everything. It broke our, our relation, Adam and Eve's relationship with God. It shattered their relationship with each other. And then it, it distorted their relationship with themselves. And let me, let me show you. First, with God... It says, um, let's see, but the Lord God called, to, verse, verse 9, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. I was naked, and I hid myself. For the, when it says earlier in that passage that God was walking in the garden, walking in the Bible is always an idiom for relationship. In the Bible, if somebody said, come walk with me, they were saying, come be in relationship with me. So God's coming, walking in the garden because he wants relationship with Adam and Eve. And instead of wanting a relationship back, they hide. Not unlike if, if somebody's calling you on your cell phone and you look and you see who it is, and then you just <laughs> turn it off and put it down. You're hiding from someone because you don't want to talk with them. You don't want relationship with them right now. That's us with God, which is exactly the opposite of what you'd expect. Okay, because I want you to put yourself in the position of God. That you created this unbelievable creation. Everything pristine, perfect. You create these two creatures that are reflect your image, that are going to be going to have just joy and love and reflect who you are in your trinity and all of that, right? And you put them in this love relationship with each other. And then they, they pull in this virus that you know. Adam and Eve didn't know, but God knew. God could see all the pain that has ever been. And it was, caused, it was at that moment that it happened. And those two were to blame. You'd think that God would come, that they would be running to God and saying, something's happened, we can feel it inside, can you fix this? That's not what happens. God pursues them. And they hide. And that's what we all do. And some of you are doing it now. Some of you are coming, some of you are watching, some of you are listening, some, wherever you are, and you know, you know deep down it's true. 
but you won't, you won't surrender because you still hide. And that happened, that started right here. That's what it broke between you and God. It mean, and it may, be, it may be because God is wanting a covenant relationship with you where he says, this isn't cost-benefit. When you become, <laughs> when you give me less than I give you, which is all the time, God says, I, I still won't run away from you. And when you feel like I'm giving you less than what you give to me, you won't run away from me because we're in covenant with each other. But it broke their relationship with God. Then it, it shattered their relationship with each other. Verse 7 it says this, uh, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now that happened before God came on the scene, which is interesting. They felt shame before God. And, and you know, when you talk to people, they'll say, Oh, you know the Bible? I don't like the Bible because it makes people feel guilty, makes people feel shame. That's not true. That's not the way it starts. What, what you don't have is them frolicking naked and God like coming into the room and going, what are you doing? Right? What happens is they sin, the virus enters in, and they immediately cover themselves, and they cover themselves not from God, but from each other. And, that's, and what they were doing was from that moment on, fear entered into our human relationships. And that's why, we, that's why you try to control what other people think of you. It, that, it starts here. We control what, what people see of us so that we can control the image that we have. And that's from how we dress, but it's also emotionally. We're always controlling, trying to control what other people think of us. started here, and it messed up all of our relationships. And then finally, it destroyed the relationship inside of themselves. Uh, verse... 11, uh, God asks, who told you you were naked? If you read the text, that's never answered. Nobody had to tell Adam. He knew. Something had happened. Something broke inside of him. And, what, and it may be that he realized that he's moved from love to power, and he begins to use people. And in order to feel good, he has to push somebody else down. And it may be that, and that's when we probably started to lie to each other or to ourselves about ourselves. And everybody does. You do. I do. We, we all think we're better than we really are. And if you talk to anybody, ask anybody, are you a good person? They'll go, yeah, I'm a pretty good person. How do you know? You know what they say? Better than most, right? Better than him. Better than her. Push down, feel good. And so that happens right away. And so he can't even be honest with himself. Okay, now quickly, i got to go through what God does because this just blew my mind how gracious God is right at the beginning. And he starts his movement toward them with questions. If you notice, he comes in and he says, where are you, Adam? And what have you done? Where are you? And whenever God is asking a question, he never is asking a question to gain information. He knows. God, God's not walking in the garden going, I wish I hadn't made him so small. Should have made him glow. because, you know, So I could see him easier. God... God is saying, where are you? What do you? You know what he's doing? He's doing what we call now an intervention. Right? I mean, in AA, the first movement toward healing is to stand up and say, hi, I'm Joe. I'm an alcoholic. What somebody's finally saying is, I'm not going to hide anymore. God, in the very first, when the virus has entered the human bloodline, his very first movement is toward healing. Adam, if you're ever going to be healed, I need you to confess, where are you? What have you done? All right? Then uh, we're going to jump ahead. Verse 20, 21 says, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Okay, would you have done that if you were God? Would you have said to them, the, these two that have now ruined your perfect creation, would you have done anything to cover their shame and their nakedness? <laughs> I would have gone, okay, you guys, you're going to be freezing tonight because <laughs> I can make that happen, right? He clothes them and he uses the skin of animals to cover their shame and their nakedness. Next week, we'll look at Israel when God introduces the sacrificial system where he allows them to use animals and their lives to cover their, sh their shame and their nakedness 
and be a sacrifice for their sin. But the thing I really wanted you to see is verse 15, and theologians have looked at this for years. Verse 15 says, uh, it's a promise from God to Satan. And it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Okay, theologians for centuries have looked at that and said, that's when it began. Because what God is saying, and I want you to look at this and see this clearly, what God is saying to Satan is someday there's going to be a descendant of this woman. And he will crush you. He will crush you and all the evil you have done this day. But when he crushes you, you will bite his heel. And the poison that you have infected this world with will infect him. And he will die. But in his death, you'll be destroyed. And all of humanity will be restored. Sound familiar? Know the story. The Bible isn't a collection of different stories. The Bible is one epic story about how God created the world out of joy and love and how the world was wrecked through this virus of sin, but how God did not give up but pursued us, pursued you, and has given us a Savior named Jesus who through his death, destroys the destroyer, and redeems you. Know the story. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, your love for us. Thanks for being so very gracious. Uh, I am sorry for all, we are sorry, for all that the virus has done in us personally, uh, within our families, within our relationships. I am sorry for how many times a day I push somebody down to make myself look good. But you sent your son to redeem us and to change us and to begin to reverse this virus and cure us from this sin. I pray that you'd do that. I pray that you would uh, help us to love you and to trust your goodness uh, through and through and to obey you in everything out of that love. Thank you for your grace. For your son Jesus, we pray this in his name. Amen.